I wonder if any of you are making New Year's resolutions this year. Well, according to the Forbes list, the top New Year's resolutions for this year are to improve mental health, improve fitness, lose weight, improve diet, improve finances, make more time for loved ones, stop smoking, learn a new skill and travel more. Any of those yours? Oh, no, a few shaky heads. Is that because you're not making any or because yours doesn't feature on there? <laughs> oh, what am I going to say? <laughs> well, I have to say, there's a few there that should be mine, but uh, I won't be making any New Year's resolutions this year because, you know what, I'm so bad at keeping them. I'm so bad at keeping them. But I'm not on my own. 91% of New Year's resolutions will be broken by the end of the year. Not to put you off, but 91% will be broken. 23% will be broken by the end of the week. And 43% by the end of January. So why do we find it so hard to keep resolutions? I think often because it is genuinely hard to change. Change is difficult for us. Sometimes the goals we make are too big so we can't achieve them really. And sometimes we don't actually want to change, we just feel that we should. And when we do manage to make those changes, then it's so easy and quick to slip back into our old ways. It's especially the case when our resolutions aren't to do with um, sort of fairly surface things, you know, what we eat or drink, and are more to do with how we relate to God and others. And it can all end up making us despair. But there is good news for each of us this morning. Jesus is all about transformation. We saw it two weeks ago when we were looking at John the Baptist, didn't we? John said someone was coming who would baptise with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who transforms us from the inside out. And here in Isaiah, we've got the Old Testament prophecy of that same transformation. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. Now, last time we were in Isaiah, it was five weeks ago and it was Advent Sunday. And we saw the mess that had become of God's people. God described them in Isaiah 28 verse 3 as a, a bridal wreath that had been trampled underfoot by drunkards. You can picture the tragedy of that image. All the expectation and hope and love that comes with the arrival of those bridal flowers. The wreath tenderly placed on the bride's head. It's an image of purity and beauty. Yet that same wreath, knocked off carelessly, forgotten and disregarded, dirted and broken, maybe even by the bride herself. And that's certainly a common picture of God's people in the Old Testament, the bride who becomes an adulterer and turns away. And God's people had certainly done that. Instead of living faithfully with God, they turned to the gods of the other nations and had started serving them. In spite of many calls to come back, they'd not returned. And so God sent them into exile. But unlike in today's world, when it's mess up and you're done, with God, there is a way back. In Isaiah, later on, he promises to send his servant a servant who will turn things around. Isaiah 61 verse 2, he promises to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to, st to bestow upon them a crown or a wreath, of course, of beauty instead of ashes, oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And it's this servant 
who's speaking in our verses from Isaiah this morning. So let's see what he says. Well, firstly, he says, God has prepared him, the servant, to bring righteousness and salvation. Verses 10 and 11. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. Now notice how those sentences are paralleled. There's lots of that in today's passage. He says the same thing twice in slightly different ways, but each bit adds to the other. We've got salvation and righteousness, hand in hand. Restored life and transformed life <clears throat> woven together. And secondly, he'll bring this transformation about by his word. He will not be silent. 62 verse 1. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. Now that word vindication, in Hebrew, that's the same word that was translated as righteousness before. The translators have kind of used righteousness and vindication interchangeably, but it is the same word in the Hebrew. So the servant will keep on speaking until the righteousness and the salvation are complete. And thirdly, this transformation will be clear for all to see, verses 2 to 5. The nations will see your vindication, your righteousness, and all kings your glory. You'll be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hepzibah in your land Beulah. For the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Well, isn't that beautiful? The bride who ran off and left her wreath to get trampled and dirty while she was sullied herself is now once again God's bride, rejoiced over, delighted in. Not deserted, not desolate, but delighted in and married it's a great picture of God's transformative power. And for the first hearers, it was a promise that God would return them to their lands and restore them. And God, of course, kept his promise. God's people did return to their land. But there was a further horizon to that promise. Remember, often biblical prophecy has several horizons different time points away from when it was first issued. The second horizon we know is going to come because, of course, God's people went back to the land. But before long, what happened? Was the bride living faithfully with her husband? Not at all. Many turned away from God again. The bride returning to her old ways. There had to be something more. And that something more would be found in Jesus. As Jesus comes, doesn't he, to bring righteousness and salvation. The angel tells Joseph in Matthew one twenty one, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The angel told the shepherds in Luke 2, today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. And don't forget Simeon's words in the temple. My eyes have seen your salvation, 
which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and to the glory of your people, Israel. So reminiscent of the words in Isaiah, isn't it? Jesus comes to bring salvation and righteousness. And, you know, we need both of those things. Righteousness without salvation is a bit like trying to keep New Year's resolutions. The heart wants to do the right thing, but there's no power to keep on going. It can lead either to failure and despair or to a measure of success, which can lead to self-righteousness. Look what I have done. We need God's saving power in our lives because the saving power becomes the transforming power. But likewise, salvation without righteousness is shallow or even fake because God always brings about change for the good in a person. It might be very tiny increments, but he does both together, salvation and righteousness. And Jesus does it all. But then Jesus's words are also essential. As a servant said, he would not keep quiet, neither does Jesus. What are Jesus's first public words? He says, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus's ministry is always one of proclamation. So even his saving death on the cross without words, it's hugely confusing. It's the most profoundly upsetting and perplexing thing for Jesus to allow if we don't know why. But Jesus tells us why. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Holy Spirit guided words of other writers make it even clearer. In the words of one of his best friends, Peter, 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. The words always have been and always will be key. Jesus keeps on proclaiming salvation. And he dies so that it can be achieved. And in God's church, in the lives of people who've received God's salvation and righteousness, that transformation will be clear. We become the beautiful bride of Jesus ourselves. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And that's what Jesus has done. We were dead in our sins, spoiled, dirtied, like that trampled wreath. But in Jesus, we are the beautiful bride rejoiced over by God. Just reflect on that for a moment. God loves you. He loves you knowing the depths that you can and maybe have fallen into. And he lifts you up and makes you radiant again. The transforming power of Jesus. And it's there in a different way in that image in the New Testament reading where Paul teaches us that we were once slaves, but we've now been adopted into God's family. Slaves to sons, broken, dirty people into radiant brides. That's the power and the love of Jesus. So if you're making your resolutions tonight, remember that true transformation 
only comes through Jesus and he's offering it to you. Not as a reward for good work, quite the opposite. He reaches down and rescues you. Why not lift your hands to receive that rescue? Know the transforming power of God in your life. And then rejoice with David and countless others after him who knew firsthand the saving grace of God. Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit out of the mud and mire, he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. That's what Jesus came to do. Have you, will you receive it? A word of prayer. Our Father God, we thank you for your precious love for each one of us. We thank you that though we have become dirtied and spoiled your love was so great for us that you didn't leave us in that place but jesus came to us to live and to die for us that we might be restored renewed beautiful in your eyes and we thank you heavenly father and we pray that you would help us to live faithfully as your transformed people through 2024 and beyond. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.